Now, before I continue, let me make a couple comments. We've covered a lot of material so far, and sometimes the, the material that we're going through here seems to be kind of a, a gloom and doom message. You know, what are we going to do about this? this? This all seems so scary, and, and you know, what's, what's the Christian response? How, how are we supposed to respond to this? I don't want to leave you guys in fear today. Um, what I'm trying to help you understand is the mindset of the 20% of the Muslim world that actually engages in violence in the name of Islam. And there's going to be, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Because what we're talking about today has, has an ultimate purpose, which you'll see at the end. So I don't want you to leave here today fearful. That's, I know that's one of the common, um, that's a common emotion that people leave here today with when I, when I teach this particular module on jihad. Gosh, this stuff is so scary. What am I going to do? You know, is, is there anything we can do? And yeah, there is. I'm going to talk about that at the end. But as I mentioned last week, um, we have no need to fear because we know that, number one, our God is with us. Our God is much more powerful than, than the God of Islam because he doesn't really exist at all. He's nothing more than, than the figment of Muhammad's wild imagination. Um, so don't leave here fearful today. And I'll wrap that up at the end when, when we get to the end. I'll tell you what the, what the Christian response to all this is, 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 is supposed to be. Um, let's quickly talk about, I'm going to move quickly now because we're a little short on time. And there's a video at the end of this that I want you guys to stick around for. You'll see Anjum Chowdhury again. He's going to share something that I think is very telling um, from his particular worldview. Methods of jihad. We've talked about the, the definition of jihad. We talked about the, the purposes of jihad. So now we're into methods of jihad. What are the methods of jihad? Well, two methods, essentially. Taking disbelievers captive or killing disbelievers outright. And I don't want to dwell on this. I don't want to spend a lot of time. But again, I mentioned Surah 47.4, which gives authority to Muslims to invade non-believing countries and take prisoners captive. So it's not always a requirement to go in and just slaughter the masses. This was not the example that Muhammad set. Again, he would offer an invitation. He would offer dawah. And if they rejected the invitation, they could become Muslims. They could become Muslims. If they rejected the invitation to become Muslims, sometimes they would just be taken captive as slaves. Um, other times they would be killed outright for the sake of Allah. So those are the, the general methods of, of jihad. I want to move on to jihad in history. But I think this is, this is going to be a little bit instructive. When you look at Muhammad's biography, you realize that Muhammad himself was a very, very much a, a warlord. Um, and that's not to be unexpected. Again, the 7th century Arabian uh, milieu, the 7th century Arabian context was very much a warfare society, a, a tribal society. Tribes always went to war with one another. It was always about who had the most powerful tribe, who could con con conquer the most people. And so it was within this context that Muhammad was raised. It was in, within this context that Muhammad began preaching this new religion. So it stands to reason that Muhammad himself was a, very much a warlord because that was the, the, the order of the day. That's just the way things were. But the difference between Muhammad and other warlords of his time is that Muhammad justified his actions with what he called divine authority. From the Quran, from revelations supposedly that the angel Gabriel gave him, that were the words of Allah. That's what set him apart from other warlords of his time. He, said, he believes that he has divine sanction for doing what he's doing. And when we look at his biography, we discover that he himself, in the, the last 10 years after he migrated to Medina, from 622 to 632, some historians have, have classified the last 10 years of Muhammad's life as the, the years of what they call the years of Maghazi, Maghazi, the years of warfare, characterized Muhammad's final years of his lifetime. He personally participated in 29 active campaigns, oversaw 57 others, supervised 57 others, 
for a grand total of no fewer than, on average, nine violent campaigns of warfare of one type or another per year. This was his life. This is what characterized his lifetime. Two significant campaigns, or, 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 or among others, but the two significant campaigns I want to point out for the purposes of class today are the first one, the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr started out as the one I was mentioning earlier. It started out not as a a war to invade a nearby tribe or group of people, but it was started out as a, a war to capture a very wealthy trading caravan. Now recall that when Muhammad was driven out of Mecca by the persecution he was facing as he preached this new religion, as he was driven out of Mecca, he left he and his followers left behind all their means of survival. They left behind their means of economic prosperity. They left behind their jobs. They left behind their trades. They left behind their family, their riches, their personal possessions. These were all in Mecca. And so they viewed Meccans as the, as the reason for their suffering the loss of their prosperity. Because the Meccans and, and the Meccan, um, the Meccan, um, I hate where my mind goes like that. The, the persecution that the Meccans were given to Muhammad and his followers, which caused them to flee Medina, they viewed the Meccans as the, the reason why they were suffering financially. And since these, these caravans were going back and forth from Mecca to uh, uh, Syria, they viewed those trading caravans of Meccan possessions as their own personal possessions, as a means to recapture some of their economic vitality. And so Muhammad authorized the interception of these caravans in order to gain back some of the goods that they had to leave behind in Mecca when they fled to Medina. You see what's going on here? So they were viewed as legitimate booty. They were viewed as legitimate possessions that Muhammad and his followers were allowed to capture for their own benefit, to restore their own economic vitality that they had to leave behind in Mecca when they were driven out. That's how the Battle of Badr started. It started as a raid on a very wealthy trading caravan. It was on its way from Mecca to Syria with all kinds of uh, gold and silver and spices and jewels and... and teas, and so forth, very um, costly items. And Muhammad learned of this particular trading caravan. They, he learned that it was on its way back from Syria to Mecca with all these goods, and he sent an army of 300 of his followers to intercept and capture this trading caravan. Now, the Meccan contingent caught word of it that Muhammad was planning this raid, so they sent a thousand people to guard the caravan against Muhammad's 300 warriors. And yet Muhammad's 300 warriors were able to overpower the 1,000 people from Mecca that were sent to protect the caravan. So because Muhammad was outnumbered three to one, and yet he was able to be victorious in this particular battle, the Muslims thought that that was a sign from Allah, that Allah was with them. And they actually believed that it wasn't the, the it wasn't Muhammad's warriors themselves who were able to capture the Meccans, even though they were outnumbered by three to one. But it was Allah who sent invisible angels to kill the Meccan contingent. So they viewed that as a as a sign from Allah that Allah was on their side. Now, in reality, when you look at the historical background, the historical context behind this particular battle, it was right before this particular battle was launched that Muhammad said. Anybody who dies as a martyr in an act of jihad is immediately ushered into heaven. So when they engage in this particular battle, they engaged in it with a mindset that they have nothing to lose. They were fearless. They were they were they went at it with everything they had. Because again, if they if they if they won the battle, they would get rich, and if they lost the battle, they would be ushered into heaven. So it was a win-win situation. They were ruthless, they were fearless. And because of that, they were able to overpower their enemy, even though they were outnumbered by three to one. <clears throat> the Battle of the Trench is another particular um, battle that Muhammad himself participated in. And this happened five years after the Hijra, so this was about, around 627 A.D. Muhammad is in Medina. And as the story goes, the people in Mecca are looking for a way to get rid of this, this nemesis, this problem. Because Muhammad was capturing all their trading caravans uh, going between Mecca and Syria. 
And he was beginning to interfere with the economic vitality of Mecca itself. And so the, the, the people of Mecca sought for a way to get rid of Mojave once and for all and restore their economic vitality. And so they, they devised this, this grand scheme, this grand plan where a, a contingent of warriors from Mecca um, made a pact with other surrounding tribes to join the Meccans in kind of a two-pronged attach, uh, attack on Muhammad in Medina. One contingent was going to come up from the south, from Mecca, and attack Muhammad from the south flank. Another contingent was going to go around and attack Muhammad from his north flank. And included in this contingent from the north flank was a, a group of Jewish people living in Medina with Muhammad called the, the Banu Kareza. So this was the grand plan. The Meccans were going to attack Muhammad from the south. Another contingent, including the Banu Kareza, was going to attack Muhammad from the north. They would trap him. They would get rid of him. The, the raid on the caravans would cease and economic vitality would be restored to Mecca. Muhammad caught word of this, this Meccan contingent planning this raid against him. So he had his warriors go out to the south of Medina to dig a large trench, a, a cavernous trench. And it just so happened that this trench was so wide and so cavernous that when the Meccan contingent came up from the south, they tried for two weeks to cross this trench and enter Medina unsuccessfully. After two weeks, they, they tucked their tail, they, they hightailed it back to, back to Mecca, they retreated. But at the same time, Muhammad discovered that the Banu Kareza, this Jewish tribe that was re residing in Medina with him, had conspired with his Meccan contingent to get rid of him. Muhammad brought the, the leader, the rabbi, the chief rabbi of this Jewish tribe out, of the Banu Kareza, put him on trial before the, the people in Medina. He gave him an invitation, he gave him dawah. Accept Islam and you'll be safe. The rabbi, the chief leader of the Banu Kareza, said that, no deal. We know what a prophet looks like. You, you call yourself a prophet? We've read our scripture. We know what Old Testament prophets look like. And sorry, you don't measure up, man. There's no way I'm going to become a Muslim, so I'm rejecting your invitation. So what did Muhammad do? Because this, this Banu Kareza tribe had conspired with the Meccans to get rid of him, Muhammad himself, one night, personally beheaded 800 Jewish men and threw their bodies into the trench. That's why it's called the Battle of the Trench. He himself participated in that. Probably one of the bloodiest battles that Muhammad himself had a personal hand in. And this is an established fact of history. So the Battle of the Trench. Interesting comment by Ibn Ishaq, uh, Muhammad's earliest biographer that I have my, in, uh, I showed you the copy of the book up here. Ibn Ishaq made this comment about Muhammad's life. He actually summarized Muhammad's entire 10 year history of his time in Medina with one sentence. And the sentence is this, he said, God sent Muhammad with this religion and he strove for it until men accepted it voluntarily or by force. God sent Muhammad with this religion and he strove for it until men accepted it voluntarily or by force. Now, <clears throat> let's look at jihad in history from the death of Muhammad until several hundred years later. Because remember, one of the arguments that Muslims use is that they're only allowed to engage in warfare for the defense of the Islamic community, to defend Islam against attacks. Yet when we look at the history of Islam, we see something entirely different. Here's a map. It kind of shows the, the spread of Islam within the first 100 years after the death of Muhammad. Now, this red area is the Arabian Peninsula. This is where Muhammad lived. This is where the Muslim community resided. During the first 100 years after the death of Muhammad, Islam spread both eastward, up into the Fertile Crescent, into what's today uh, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, all the way to the western borders of India. Also spread westward across North Africa, Egypt, Tunisia, uh, Nigeria, or not Nigeria, um, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, 
crossed the Strait of Gibraltar into Spain, and its advance was stopped in 732 AD, a mere 100 years later, by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours. Now remember, the common argument is that Muslims are allowed to fight defensively. So my question when Muslims bring up this particular argument is how much of this rapid spread 100 years after the death of Muhammad was defensive? How many of these countries were attacking Muslims? None of them. Which seems to suggest that the Muslims of Muhammad's time even understood jihad as an offensive engagement for the spread of Islam. Let's look at another series of maps. The shaded, the orange shaded areas is the representative, essentially, of, of what we saw in this previous map. This is, this is the, the Islamic community around 800 AD. 100 years later, it spread a little bit more. 200 years later, 1100 AD, look how much more it spread. 1300 AD. And finally, 1500 AD. Again, how much of that was defensive? None of it. So we see, even from a historical standpoint, that Islam understands jihad to be offensive, as, their, as the Quran suggests, as the Hadith suggests, as Islamic Sharia manual suggests. Jihad, the primary purpose, is the offensive spread of Islam, not defensive. Let's look at a historical analysis just based on the Quran. This was an analysis done by a, a scholar by the name of Richard Bailey some years ago. And Richard Bailey wanted to understand the historical context of the peaceful verses in the Quran versus the violent verses in the Quran. Rem remember last week when we talked about the, the significance of the two early periods of Islamic history, the Meccan period and the Medina period. Mecca period from 610 to 622, and the Medina period from 622 to 632. And I mentioned one of the primary reasons we need to make that distinction is to understand the significance of when particular verses of the Quran were given to Muhammad, because they were given to Muhammad over a 23-year period, 13 years in, in Mecca, 10 years in Medina. And you have to understand when verses were given to Muhammad, how they relate to the context, and how they relate to the, the, the earlier verses versus the latter verses, when there is a conflicting verse in the Quran. Because Muhammad preached peace, he also preached violence. How do the peaceful violence, peaceful verses of the Quran and the violent verses of the Quran, how do you reconcile those with, with each other? This was the goal of, of Richard Bailey's analysis. He says, we need to put these, these verses in context and see what Muhammad's lifestyle was like, what, what context did he find himself in when these peaceful verses of the Quran came to him, versus what was the context when the violent verses of the Quran came to him. And he broke down the, the context of the Quran into four historical periods. And he calls stage one is early in Mecca. Muhammad's preaching this new religion, that there's one God worthy of worship, and his name is Allah, to a very polytheistic society who doesn't want to accept this notion. They have 360 gods that they worship. Muhammad has little power. He's, uh, he's an underdog. He has little political clout. He has no military backing behind him. He's essentially a nobody. And during this time in Muhammad's life, we find Muhammad essentially preaching verses of peace. Can't we, essentially, can't we just all get along with one another? To you or your religion, to me, mine. Be patient and bear with those who deny the truth. Invite people to the way of God only with gracious preaching and arguments and so forth. So when Muhammad is, is an underdog and he has no military might behind him and, and little political influence, he preaches verses of peace. Stage two, according to Richard Bailey, was late Mecca, right before the Hijra, right before the migration to Medina. And here we see in stage two, when we look at the verses that were given to Muhammad in this, at this time in his prophetic career, we see verses that, that give permission to Muslims to engage in defensive warfare. You're allowed to fight to defend the Ummah. You're allowed to fight to de defend Islam, to defend the name of Islam. Surah 22, verses 39 to 41, and Surah 22, 58, for example. In stage 3, 
which we call early Medina. This is after the Hijra. Now Muhammad's migrated from Mecca to Medina. And he was, he was actually invited to Medina by several Jewish clans up in that area who invited Muhammad to be kind of their, their arbitrator amongst one another. He was actually invited there to be a political leader at the behest of Jewish, Jewish clans. So he has a lot of political clout. He's looked to as a political leader. He's looked to as a figure of authority. And because of battles like the Battle of Badr, he's now gaining a, a, a following of followers who see that by following this guy, I can get rich. I can achieve a lot of material wealth. So he's not only got political clout, but he's, he's gaining some military strength. And what kind of verses do we see given to Muhammad at this time in his prophetic career? Well, offensive fighting is no longer permitted. Or, I mean, defensive fighting is no longer permitted. Now it's obligatory. You must fight to defend the Ummah. You must fight to defend Islam. It's an imperative. And then finally in stage four, which we call late Mecca, we see not only is defensive fighting obligatory, now offensive fighting is obligatory. It is required for you Muslims to march forth in battle in jihad for the sake of spreading Islam. And this is essentially where the last two chapters of the Quran were given to Muhammad, Surah 5 and Surah 9. And if you look at Surah 5 and Surah 9, you see that both of those chapters, and Surah 9 in particular, are filled with essentially verses of, of, of warfare, verses of slay the infidel wherever you find them, lie in wait in ambush for them. Surah 929, which we spoke about earlier, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid the things which Allah has forbidden, nor um, refuse to accept Islamic monotheism, especially among the people of the book. So these are the verses that were given to Muhammad in his last stage of his life, where he had, when he had gained political clout, significant political clout, he had a strong military backing. He was the authority, he was the supreme authority figure of his time in that, in, in that particular context. So when Muhammad is strong militarily, when he is strong politically, he says fight. When he's the underdog, when he has no political clout, when he's the minority, he says peace. Do you see a pattern here? This is the pattern we see set throughout history when Muslims go into foreign lands. When they go in, when they're the underdog, they follow the example of Muhammad. We have no strength politically, we have no strength militarily, we're just going to say Islam is peaceful. And as they gain more and more clout, both politically and militarily, they become more and more progressively violent. This is the pattern that Muhammad set. Now pay attention to this clip. Listen to this Islamic scholar. Because he's going to talk about, remember, I started off class today saying that there, there are moderate, peaceful Muslims, and indeed there are, and there are violent Muslims. And the question we need to ask is, are the violent Muslims really hijacking Islam, or are they, do they actually find support for what they do in their scripture, in, in the example of Muhammad? Listen to what this Islamic scholar said. The Quran is like a big store, the, like a big supermarket. In this book, you are able to pick different answers. You are able to make peace according to the Quran. You are able to declare war according to the Quran. So many different voices come out of the Quran. Moderate people have their support in the verses of the Quran. Radical people have the same thing with different verses in the Quran. Did you hear that? There's so many voices in the Quran. Moderate people, if they want to justify themselves, they can, they can justify their moderate position based on verses in the Quran. But radical people, they can find the same support in different verses of the Quran. So are they really hijacking the teachings of Islam? Not according to even this scholar. Quickly, let's talk about some criticisms leveled against particularly Christians when we, when we start talking about Islam and Jihad and the spread of Islam around the world at the point of the sword. One of the common criticisms that Muslims always like to bring up is, well, you Christians have no right to talk about the violent spread of Islam. Christianity is filled with its own forms of violence, particularly the Crusades. So you guys had the same problem in your history as we do. 
how dare you criticize us for Islamic Jihad? Right? Well, that, that on the face of it, that may seem to be a legitimate criticism. Because there are Christians who have engaged in violent things in, in, in the name of Christianity. And, and the Crusades was one of those black marks, black stains on Christian history. That's undeniable. We can't deny that. But let's, let's do a, an honest comparison between Islamic Jihad and the Crusades and see if they, they actually are comparable. When you look at the, the history of Islamic Jihad and you compare it against the Crusades, you find some, you, we can make some interesting observations. For example, with the idea of imperialism. Just comparing Islamic Jihad and the Crusaders of the 11th century. Who were the first imperialists? Christians or Muslims? We just saw maps of the spread of Islam just within the first 100 years after Muhammad's death. When Islam spread both east and west and covered a significant portion of the world as, as they knew it then. The Crusades didn't come along for 400 years later. So who was, in, who was involved in conquering people first? The Crusaders or the Muslims? Who was first? Second of all, second of all the scope of the, of the Crusades versus the scope of, of Islamic Jihad. Islamic Jihad has been going on since the death of Muhammad and even before. We talked at the ba about, about the Battle of Badr. Even during Muhammad's lifetime, he would send out people to capture people who did not worship Muhammad, who did not embrace Islam, even among the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. In his lifetime, Muhammad himself was responsible for the elimination of every last Jew from the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. With, with his slaughtering of the Banu Qurayza, the Banu Qurayza was the last surviving Jewish tribe there. When he beheaded their 800 men in one night, that was the, that was the extinction of Jews on the Arabian Peninsula. Scope of the jihads. The scope of, of the jihad versus the scope of the crusades. Jihad has been going on for 1,400 years ever since the death of Muhammad. The crusades, however, were limited to a less than 200 year period. So the scopes are entirely different. The crusades were, were a very limited scope for a very limited time. And then, and then once they were done, that was the end of it. They, they have not been an ongoing function of violent Christians, if you want to call them that. Second, thirdly, the example of Muhammad versus the example of Jesus. When Christians engage in violence in the name of Christianity, are they following the teachings of Christ? Remember what, what Jesus told Peter when Peter pulled out his sword and cut off the ear of Malchus? What did Jesus tell Peter? Peter, put away your sword for those who live by the sword die by the sword. Jesus never taught violence in fact, he, as far as our persecutors are concerned, he says, pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Love even your enemies. If you only love those who love you, what good is that? What merit is that to you? What credit is that to you? Even sinners and tax collectors do the same thing. So Jesus taught a message of love. Jesus never advocated warfare. Muhammad, on the other hand, not only advocated warfare, he participated in it. So when we look at Jesus and compare him to Muhammad, we see two completely different paradigms. When Christians are engaging in warfare in the name of Christ, they are acting contrary to the teachings of Christ and his example. But when Muslims engage in warfare in the name of Islam, they're not only acting in accord with what their scripture teaches, but they're acting in accord with what their prophet set the example for Completely different paradigm. So there's no con there's no comparison. When Muslims try to compare the Islamic Jihad to the Islamic or Islamic Jihad to Christian Crusades, they're trying to compare apples to grapes. It's an Ill illegitimate comparison. Let's talk about this issue of abrogation in the Quran, because this also plays into how do you distinguish between Peaceful verses in the Quran versus violent verses in the Quran when you see both of them and they contradict one another. One of the common verses that Muslims like to bring up 
in their support of Islam being a peaceful religion is Surah 2, verse 256, which says, which seems to suggest that nobody can, can compel another person to become a Muslim. He says, let there be no compulsion in religion. The truth will separate itself, se separate itself naturally from the error. Truth and error will self-divide. So you can't compel somebody to become a Muslim. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Yet you find other verses in the Quran which says, fight those who don't believe in Allah, nor in the last day. Particularly among the people of the book, who don't fight those who don't embrace Islamic monotheism. So how do you reconcile these two seemingly contradictory verses? They're both in the Quran. They're both the word of God. You saw that scholar earlier. Moderate people can find their support in the Quran, and radical people can find their support. Because there's different verses in the Quran that contradict each other. Well, according to Islamic doctrine, you apply what's called the law of abrogation. The law of abrogation suggests that when a contradictory, when two contradictory verses are found in the Quran, you look to the context of those two verses and when they were given to Muhammad, what portion of his prophetic career they were given to Muhammad. And the later verse always supersedes the earlier verse. So when two contradictory verses are, are, are found, you apply the law of abrogation. Whichever one is the later one that was given to Muhammad, that overrules the earlier one. The, the, the earlier contradictory verse is set aside. It is no longer valid. That's, that's what the law of abrogation is all about. And it, it comes from Surah 2, verse 106, or Surah 16, verse 101. Two scriptures in the Quran which support this idea of abrogation. So when you take these two verses as an example, Surah 2, verse 256, and Surah 929, they seem to contradict one another. Let there be no compulsion in religion, but slay those who don't believe in Allah. Which one is the rule of the day? Which one is the marching orders for Muslims today? You apply the law of abrogation. Surah 2, verse 256 came to Muhammad just after the Hijra, just after his move to Medina. Surah 929 came to Muhammad right before his deathbed in 632. So this one came to Muhammad, Surah 2, verse 256. In 622 A.D., let there be no compulsion in religion. 632 A.D., ten years later, Muhammad was given the verse, fight those who don't believe in Allah. Which one holds true for today? The last one. Which means the last verse overrules this earlier verse. According to this doctrine of abrogation in Islam, all the violent verses that you find in Surah 9 abrogate or replace, or replace or make null and void all the earlier verses of peace that Muhammad ever uttered out of his mouth. So the final marching orders given to Muslims today in Surah 9 is to engage in warfare, jihad, with the idea of spreading Islam offensively. It is said that Surah 9, verse 5 alone, and Surah 9, abrogate about 200 earlier peaceful verses that had been given to Muhammad during his time in Mecca. So those peaceful verses are no longer relevant for Muslims today, according to the doctrine of abrogation. So let's look at some conclusions here. I think from looking at the Quran, from looking at the, looking at the Hadith, I think we've been able to establish that both teach jihad as primarily warfare to establish Islam against those who believe not in Allah, period. This whole idea of jihad as an internal spiritual struggle has little if no support in Islamic scripture, either in the Quran or in the Hadith. It's supported only by one weak Hadith, which I mentioned at the beginning of class, that no Muslim today deems to be reliable or authoritative. So jihad is not a spiritual struggle to be a better person. Jihad, by definition, from Islam's own sources, is armed conflict with the idea of the expansion of Islam. Muhammad set the example that Muslims follow today. Peace verses have been abrogated by later verses which seem to contradict them. 
And so let's get back to our challenge question that I gave you guys at the beginning of the session today. Is there such a thing as a Muslim extremist? Why not? Because they're not extremists at all. They're actually following the commands of their scripture. They're following the example that Muhammad set for them. And what do you call somebody who follows their scripture literally? An extremist? A, a, a good Muslim. Now again, I don't, I don't want you to leave with the impression that every Muslim is like this. And that's certainly not the case today. But those Muslims who do engage in violence in the name of Islam, do they have justification for doing what they do? Based on their scripture and based on their prophet? Absolutely they do. They're not hijacking a religion. They're doing what Muhammad did and they're doing what Muhammad said to do. I think Jesus prophetically spoke of the days that we're living in today. Interestingly enough, in John chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. Look at these verses and see how they apply to the day. It says, These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They'll put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Why are Muslims doing these things today? Because they don't know the Father. They don't know Jesus, the Prince of Peace. They've got the wrong worldview. They've got the wrong mindset. They've been told a lie. They're deceived. When I quit my job five years ago at Southern California Edison, I told my co-workers what I was going to be doing, and they, they called me nuts. Why do you want to talk to those people? They're going to cut your head off. And I said, primarily because of this. Because the, the conflict that we see going on around the world today, even though it has physical ramifications in physical armed conflict, it is not primarily a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle between the forces of darkness and the forces of light. And the only way that we're ever going to achieve world peace is for Muslims to meet the Prince of Peace. Amen? This is the light at the end of the tunnel. As I, men I mentioned, I think last week, what I call the Saul to Paul paradigm. Because what we see Muslims doing today is the same thing that Saul was doing to the early church. He was going around killing them. He was going around persecuting them because he believed they worshipped the wrong God. He was going around killing them in the service of the God as he thought him to be. Paul had a, or Saul had a, a Damascus Road experience. He had a face-to-face -face encounter with the living Christ and turned instantly from the greatest persecutor of the early Christian church to the greatest, most dynamic missionary in early church history. And I think today, if we can do the same thing, if we can share Jesus with these radical Muslims, as they're called, and they can become just as radical for Jesus as they are for the cause of Islam, as they perceive it to be, then this world will be a better place. <clears throat> Don't you agree? I think if Jesus can do it in Paul's day, he can certainly do it today. I think he's up to the job. They just need to hear. How are they going to believe in him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they're sent? This is the answer to the world. This is the answer that Muslims are looking for. You see, they think they have to shed their own blood to atone for their sin, but they don't have to. The blood's already been shed for them. They just need to get the message, right? All right. I think you guys are going to be blown away by this next video clip. We're going to wrap up with this. It's about a five-minute clip. Again, it's Anjum Chowdhury. Anjum Chowdhury 
is the leader of the most radical party in London right now. Andrew Chowdhury, Jay Smith has debated. Jay Smith has debated Omar Bakri Mohammed, who was Anjum Chowdhury's leader until Omar Bakri Mohammed was ex deported back to Lebanon for his radical stance. In fact, there's a picture of Jay and Omar shaking hands. Jay told me one time, he told me a couple years ago, he had a conversation with Omar Bakri Mohammed and said that Omar Bakri Mohammed and, and, and I consider each other friends. Because Omar Bakri Mohammed actually respects Jay Smith. He says, if there's one man that I can say that's a Christian that I have utmost respect for, it's Jay Smith. Because he actually is not afraid to take a stand for what he believes to be true. He's not afraid to tell it like it is. And he defends Christianity with every ounce of vigor that he has. So I respect him for that. But Omar Bakri said at the same time, when Sharia comes to London, Jay, you're going to be the first guy I've got to kill. He told, he told Jay that to his face. <laughs> How would you like to meet this guy in the street corner? These are, the kind of, these are the kind of people that Jay interacts with on a daily basis. But listen to Anjum Chowdhury. This is a, an interview that was done about three weeks after the July 27, 2005 subway bombings in London, if you guys remember that event. Um, Andrew Chowder is going to be interviewed by a talk show host. And I won't, I won't spill the beans, but listen to what he has to say, and then we'll wrap it up. Four young Muslim men believed to have conducted the suicide bomb attacks in London on July the 7th were British, a homegrown cell. Who recruited them? Who convinced them of the righteousness of murdering innocent civilians? The British government is planning new measures against what they call preachers of hate. But defining the boundaries between free speech and incitement poses a massive challenge for the police and for Muslim communities. Hard Talk has interviewed a number of Muslim figures. My guest today was, till last year, the leader of the radical Islamist group, al Muhajirun in the UK. Anjum Chowdhury, welcome to Hard Talk. You're welcome. Let's go back to July the 7th. What was your first reaction when you heard of the bomb attacks in London? Our first reaction as Muslims was, why did this take place in London? And, uh, what have we done to make ourselves in a position where people are wanting to throw bombs or to detonate bombs in the heart of the city of Great Britain? Did you, did you assume from the beginning it had been done by Muslims? Well, we can't make assumptions of uh, who carried out uh, uh, bombings in London. Obviously, the IRA were active until very recently. There are other people who have uh, 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 grudges, who have access to grind, I'm sure, against the British government. But at the end of the day, uh, there was every likelihood that Muslims would retaliate against the atrocities that the British government was committing in Iraq, in, in, in Afghanistan, and the support of the uh, State of Israel was always going to have some kind of repercussion. Far from being surprised, you expected it? Well, we expected, uh, we, we said that there was always a possibility of there being a retaliation from Muslims against Britain if Britain did not withdraw their forces from Iraq and if they did not stop meddling, if they did not, uh, stop meddling in the affairs of Muslims. See, when you look at what was said by, for example, Sheikh Omar Bakri, the of Mahajirun. He said, going back to 2004, in a Portuguese magazine, and I quote, there are freelancers ready to launch Al-Qaeda-style attacks. I know they are on the verge of launching a big operation in London. It sounds like he knew. He knew something. No, it's, uh, there's a difference between uh, judging the, uh, the political situation properly and obviously those people who are living in a cocoon. I mean, you don't need to be blind to appreciate that if you're going to have a foreign policy where you're occupying a country, let's face it, Baghdad doesn't lie between London and Birmingham. It's in another country. If you're going to send forces over there, if you're going to occupy someone's land, if you're going to support a state which is, uh, which is stealing the land of Muslims, which is the state of Israel in Palestine, if you're going to be carpet bombing uh, a country yeah, like Afghanistan... I, I, I'd, I'd allowed you, like, allowed like, you like, to like lay out a case then, which links, then, in your view, then, then the bombing the with Iraq. But, but let yeah. me just ask you this question. Before we get into all of that, will you unreservedly condemn 
what happened? No, we're not, we're not in the business of condoning and condemning. I mean, this question has been posed many times to Muslims uh, over the last few weeks, and it seems ironic that when uh, uh, over 100 thousands, uh, up to a million uh, Muslims died in Iraq because of the sanctions. Yeah, but we're not when talking about Iraq no, at this, this moment. We no, are talking about perverse, bomb attacks in London that killed that, um, over 50 civilians, including Muslim civilians, civilians from all over the world. Murder, plain and simple. Will you condemn it? What I will say is that uh, you need to have a look at the whole picture. If you're going to be running around asking for condemnations, if you're going to be putting, if you're going to be pointing the finger of responsibility towards Muslims, if you're going to be introducing new laws and you're going to then turn a blind eye to your own policies overseas and you're not going to take any responsibility and far more Muslims have died because of the British foreign policy in, uh, in Muslim countries. You need to start condemning your own foreign policy. You right, can't so I, to I think we've established you condemn. will not you condemn it. I just wonder why you won't condemn it when your own leader, Omar Bakri, said quite simply, I condemn the killing of innocent people on the 20th of July. Yeah, Why won't you say what he said? No, at, the, at the end of the day, innocent people, when we say innocent people, we mean Muslims. As far as uh, non-Muslims are concerned, they have, uh, they have not accepted Islam. As far as we're concerned, that is a crime against God. I want but, to be clear about uh, what you're as, saying. As this is very important. People, you're yeah, saying no, me, only Muslims can it, count as count. innocent people. As far as Muslims are concerned, you're innocent if you, if you are a Muslim, then you're innocent in the eyes of God. If you are non-Muslim, then you're guilty of not believing in God. Yes, there were many victims. You're guilty. They're, guilty. They're, they're guilty are you seriously suggesting that everybody on those tube trains and on that bus in London on July the 7th was in some way a legitimate target? You don't l allow me to answer the question fully, Stephen. You're never going to get to the bottom of it. Let me, let me begin by saying, as a Muslim, you must have allegiance where the Sharia says that you have allegiance. You must hate and love for the sake of Allah. You must praise and dispraise uh, for what the Sharia says, you praise and dispraise. So as a Muslim, I must support my Muslim brothers and sisters, wherever they are in the world. I must have allegiance with them. I must cooperate with them. I must love them. And similarly, on the other hand, I must have hatred towards everything which is non-Islam. I mean, you know what, I'm, I'm trying not I to interrupt have... you too much, but, yeah, but I still I'm don't coming, feel you have addressed my question. Were those people on the underground trains and on the bus legitimate I'm, targets I'm because they come, were not Muslim? I'm coming on to your point. You've asked, some you've asked of them about, actually were. No, no, you've asked about two or three different, uh, different questions. You've asked about innocence. You've asked about whether they were legitimate targets. You've asked about whether I'm condoning or condemning. You've asked about whether I praise We've moved on those questions. No, but all of those All of those questions deserve to be answered. And obviously, we have the time to explore them. So if I just continue with this particular point, as far as Muslims are concerned, their allegiance is always with the Muslims. So I will never condemn a Muslim for, for what he does. Indeed, I'm, I, I must stand with him, whether he's an oppressor or oppressor. I think that's, that's enough. You, you, you get the point, right? He's, he's, there's nothing ambiguous about his position at all. Is he a radical? Is he an, is he an extremist? Is he misconstruing what the Quran says? And unless you believe that his is only an isolated opinion, here's a headline that I captured on the internet a couple months ago from the Middle East Media Research Institute, memory.org. If you guys don't go to this website, jot it down. It's, it's a fantastic resource. M-E-M-R-I dot O-R-G. Middle East Media Research Institute captured this headline February 13, 20, 2011, last year. Leader of the Palestinian Salafi Jihadi Group. It is permissible to kill Jewish and Christian civilians in jihad since they are fundamentally not innocent. Where do they get that idea from? Is that just something they concocted out of thin air? Nope, comes straight out of the pages of the Quran. All right, let's wrap it up. What's our obligation? How are Muslims going to come to know true peace? Only when they meet the Prince of Peace. What's our obligation? To bring them the message. What did Jesus say about fear? Because as I mentioned at the beginning, this, this subject leaves a lot of people fearful. But Jay Smith himself has gone head, head to head with a guy who says, when Sharia law comes to London, i got to cut your head off, man. Jay Smith has no fear. I have no fear. Neither should you. I've got a target on my head from Al Shabaab right now, the Al Qaeda arm in, Som in Somalia. For some work that I did in Kenya last year, discipling a new convert out of Islam. Do I fear? Do I care? Nope. Why? 
Because I know that when my God tells me he will never leave me or forsake me, he will never leave me or forsake me. When Jesus said, I am with you always, that means I am with you always. Not until you come head to head with a guy who wants to cut your neck off. Always is always. I know that, that my mission on earth has been preordained by God. He has placed me on earth to do a mission. He called me into this ministry five years ago unambiguously. There was nothing ambiguous about it. The calling was clear. And since the calling was clear, I know that He's not going to allow any harm to come to me that I can't handle until my mission on earth for Him is done. So why should I fear? And when that day comes, there's time for me to leave the earth. Why should I want to stick around here any longer anyway? I've got no reason to fear. Neither should you. When you go to witness to a Muslim, you have the power of the Holy Spirit behind you. And there's no harm that can come to you unless God ordains it. We have no fear. We have no need to fear. Muslims need to hear the gospel. They need to meet the Prince of Peace. And the only way they're going to do it is through us. True peace will not happen until every Muslim knows the Prince of Peace. What's our response? The good news. Now, as we wrap it up, I was introduced during the break to a, a lady, I'm going to put her on the spot for a minute, who's a former Muslim from Malaysia. And has, has everything I've been talking about today true to Islam? Yes. This is what they're taught in the Muslim world. You don't hear a lot of this stuff today in the West because they try to cover it up. They try to sugarcoat it. But this is true Islam. Because they've been deceived. They've got the line. They need the truth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. <clears throat> Lord, our hearts go out. We, we ache. We mourn. For those who've been captivated by the lie of Satan. Who've been deceived into believing that they must shed their own blood to atone for their sins when you've already done the work for us. Father, the lie, the lie that they're believing in, that they're shedding their blood for, is taking them straight on a path to hell. Lord, how will they know about you unless we bring the message to them? How are they going to know in whom they've not heard and how they hear unless there's a preacher? And how should they preach unless they're sent? Father, I pray that you would stir in each of us, Lord, a compassion, a love, a conviction of the need to share the good news with Muslims, to introduce them to the Prince of Peace so that they can know what true peace is all about. Father, equip us and give us the opportunity to do just that. Mobilize us. Remove the fear. Let us rely on you and trust in you as we bring the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.